Okay, so very good evening, uh, Trinity Minha from Paris and from the Robot Art Museum in Shanghai. It is really a great honor as the director of the Robot Art Museum to welcome you. And of course, a great, great pleasure to curate with you your project entitled Traveling in the Dark that exists as an exhibition. Uh, from November 2022 to February 2023, but also as a publication, as an artist book uh, with a Moose Publishing House. And I have to say all this project is part of a larger collaboration with the NTU CCA in Singapore with an exhibition that has happened in 2020 and with a, an exhibition just open at the Kunstverein in Stuttgart. So I'm really grateful for your generosity, your engagement, and, and the way uh, you conceive this uh, tailor-made uh, project. Thank you very much. So um, you are a film director, a poet and writer, a theorist, and you are a distinguished professor at the University of San Francisco, Berkeley. Um, I would like to have a first question, very naive actually, because you are uh, engaging in different practices and medium and disciplines and from theory to sound, uh, from uh, filmmaking to exhibition. So I would like to know how are you dealing with these disciplines or category? Do you feel belonging to one of them or are you navigating in between, in and out all these uh, disciplines? Yes, um, you know, actually, First, I really have to thank you. You know, it's uh, as a curator, you are really the ideal <laughs> person to be working with. And I really thank you and also thank the, the team at RAM who had made so many efforts despite, you know, the times that we are living in now. And so I'm very happy to have this, uh, to have this opportunity to share the work with you. Concerning disciplines, you know, I've always had problems with these disciplines in the academic world. And actually, even my my own, the degrees that I have gotten from all these years of education are in several fields, you know. So it's in music composition, in literary theory, and within literature, I've done American literature, French literature, Francophone, and African literature, and so on. So the disciplines are really, for me, another kind of boundaries, which yeah. question, you know, also in my films, you know, boundaries between genre, boundaries between disciplines. So I have always worked in between these disciplines. And yes. of course, you know, it's not an easy place to be in. Yes, and I, I remember very well a beautiful moment when we were preparing the project and we were talking about our mutual passion for poetry and, and you say that for you poetry does not exist simply as a written text, but it consists really as a Pra real practice of life means in the way we can pay attention to the simple acts of the daily life. Uh, and it was also very comforting for me because I can say also when I'm watching any of your movie, I don't feel like watching only a movie, but I feel very much engaged with uh, different textures coming from different materials. Could it be a sound, a cut in the image, a silence, a voice? And so I'm also very curious uh, to know how you can engage with movie making to touch this uh, very intimate part of the living that is extremely precious, but also very rare today. So yeah, this is how I feel. I cannot uh, categorize um, your movie only as a movie, 
or the poetry only as a text. I just feel this uh, engagement. So can you talk more about this? Yes, thank you uh, for your feedback. I actually, you know, continue on what we, we said earlier about discipline. And here I'm focusing on poetry. For me, um, as you said, uh, poetry is in the living. So actually poetry can happen across all kinds of discipline. Like for example, I love to read philosophy when it is also poetic. In other words, to find poetry in philosophy. And yes. in, the, in the same way, I love to find philosophy in poetry. So poetry is not just a category apart from everything else, but actually it incorporates, you know, everything uh, mm. that comes into life. And that, of course, you know, uh, would cu cut across many disciplines. And in, yes. in film in particular, you know, I think I have never been, uh, I have always been at odds with categories like documentary, fiction, experimental, educational, and so on. Because for me, film is first and foremost like an experience of the body. And with that, you know, I already would not accept simply that it is an art for the eye, rather something for, for the body. And it is constantly composed of movement and stillness. So for me, the movement, you know, a film can be defined in terms of movement and in terms of undercurrents. Like, for example, there is a movement to receive, to reach out to the world from the inside. And that's what uh, the film world may call fiction film. And there is a movement the, to let the world come to you from the outside, which the film world may call documentary. But these inside-outside movements are always overlapping. So for me, the, the genre are needlessly reductive. And that's one of the first things that we deal with, you know, in terms of film. A film is first and foremost a film. And so for me, there are always at least two aspects to the film, and these two can multiply. Um, this is what I call the two-fold commitment, that on the one hand, you are committed to the subject, and on the other, you are committed to the medium or the creative tools that you use in order to convey whatever you would like to share with the audience. So this twofold commitment means that um, in terms of experience of the body, it's not just the ear or the eye, but most of the time, you know, the sensorial realm are working together. Like for example, in Chinese ancient arts, um, a poet is always a painter. You know, calligraphy is a form of painting. And a painter is always a poet. And when we refer to reading, for example, um, it is said that you have to eat wisely. You know, so eating and reading go together. And when it comes to smelling incense, people don't say smell incense, but they say listen to incense. So you see all these sensorial realm is what I would like to so solicit from the viewer, that the viewer come in my film with an ear that speak, that sees, and an eye that hears. You know, so the that hearing is beautiful. <laughs> and the speaking ear. So this is certainly one of the main aspects, you know, of the films that I make. Yes, and when you talk about the way you try to escape the different genres, such as the documentary, it's also important to mention that you uh, produced a new uh, movie. Uh, supported by the Robot Art Museum and uh, uh, NTUCCA in Singapore. And this movie is entitled, What About China? And previously, you also have made different uh, films that were shot in different localities, such as Senegal, Vietnam, or Japan. Uh, can you tell us more about how 
you engage with such contexts and places. I believe it has nothing to do about documenting a locality or speaking about people, right? Yes. You know, um, I, I um, thank you for the for the question because most of the time, um, because my film tend to be seen as quote and unquote documentary, even though at first, you know, it was really troubling for the documentary world to accept my film. But um, because it is considered as a documentary, we are really dealing with truth and information, for example, even though there are many kinds of truth, of course. And going to these different cultures, first of all, as you could see in the body of my work, I am committed to what one can call the, glo the global south. Um, in other words, you know, I haven't made any film on Europe or on the US or anything, even though many, many times people have asked me, why don't you make a film on the US? Or why don't you make a film on um, on one of the country in, in Europe? We would give you funding for that and so on. But I have been so far very committed to making films, you know, in the part of this part of the world called, um, you know, the third world, even though, you know, not all countries are as we could see with Japan and China now, a really third world country. But in any case, you know, um, I was committed to it. So I approached all of this culture. Most of the time, I wanted, just like in the first film, 16 millimeter film that I made, Reassemblage, I wanted no, to, yes, um, I wanted to approach uh, Senegal in a non-knowing way, in, um, that means that you don't, no matter what kind of luggage and knowledge, you know, you have of the area or of the, all the research that you did before, as soon as you start shooting, you leave all this luggage behind and you enter with a non-knowing mode, which is also part of what I call going into the dark, you know, in order to make films and traveling, for example, into this realm of the dark where you can create from a, a place that is fresh and that is non-knowing. And non-knowing is something completely different from ignorance. There's nothing to do with ignorance or with anti, a form of anti-intellectualism or anything like that. On the contrary, non-knowing is really, um, for me, a place that is situated in between ignorance and knowledge. So if you come into a place uh, not knowing, then you can approach reality in a very fresh way. You are not being pulled down, you know, by all the knowledge that you know about that place already. And mm. this is what I have done throughout, you know, even with my own culture, like the films on Vietnam that I have made. Um, I, the more one goes inside, the wider it gets. So when we talk about an identity, like a film like Surname Viet Kim Nam, Nam, you know, it's the title itself give you like the name of a country that you take on into your body, you know, almost like an individual uh, experience of what Vietnam is. The more you go inside, the wider that reality gets. And you can see that what you think is Vietnamese is not so much Vietnamese. And in fact, I can say that Vietnamese has so much of Chinese culture. My ancestral culture is actually Chinese. You know, so from there you go wider and wider. And the personal is never simply personal, but actually it is always an index of the collective, something that is communal and societal. It is also why when you started to conceive the project Traveling in the Dark, um, I have to say it's very fascinating for me because when you work into an institution of art, you have to show um, you have to show as much as you can an object or images. And you seem to invite us to learn 
or to touch um, the invisible, the unseen, instead of being obsessed with an absolute visibility. And this, I just find it um, challenging, but extremely important. So uh, this experience of uh, uh, visibility and non-visibility, the seen and the unseen, is it um, a whole process in your creation or do you want to raise some other topics related to this concept of traveling in the dark? Yes, it. Uh, we can approach it in many ways, you know. Um, there are many threads that I can pull out from the films I made, and especially from What About China, because What About China is really uh, a film that was made during pandemic time. You know, in other words, you always go into the underground when you are in shut mode, you go into in the, in the underground to find the springs. Mm -hmm. So in you know, the, the spring water, actually comes out from this underground. And this is for me the the other meaning of what underground could mean. That you are not simply under the earth or into darkness or isolated, but at the same time in this darkness you are actually experiencing and bringing out, you know, spring waters, underground springs, in other words. So for me, this notion of going in, into the dark, in What About China, there was a statement that says, um, you know, working with the visible in order to entice the invisible into action so that we, with reality, when we deal with reality, if we don't want to reduce it, you know, to simply what we see or to the material things that are in front of us, then we are dealing, we want to always open a space for the invisible to come with what we show and this is very important it's not abstract at all you know for me it's it's very concrete that with an image you and we do that all the time you know viewers do that all the time they receive an image but actually there is a whole part that come with that image that is invisible and that is unique to each viewer also, you know, so working with the enticing the invisible to action is, you know, bringing out with the visible, with whatever you say, you show, or whatever you uh, bring to hearing, um, with, with that, you also suggest something else, you know, so you lead the people into this realm and uh, of darkness that is not near darkness, you know, it's not the opposite of uh, light, but actually, you know, I um, have this anecdote from um, uh, a Zen story, you know, that uh, there's a disciple who work with his master until late into the night. And then uh, the master turned around and said, it's getting late, why don't you go home? And so the disciple opened the door to go outside. And um, he said, it's so dark outside, I can't see. So the master gave him a candle you know, in order to walk with. But as soon as he went out into the darkness, the master blew off <laughs> the candle. So you have to learn how to walk without candle. And for me, this is wonderful because we have to learn how to see with eyes wide shut, you know, you close your eyes and you can see. And you, we have to learn how to see with the light in the night because moonlight and sunlight are very different. And I actually brought some of that out in What About China when I talk about the fact that we have to move away from noon light where everything is lit up, you know, and flattened out in one light. Rather than that, we have many... Uh, other kinds of light that comes in. And uh, there's even a, a quote that says, you know, whenever you are facing the dark, then um, don't simply stay in the dark. And when you are facing light, don't simply stay, you know, in, in the bright light. 
So this is another aspect, you know, that is very important in the film that everything that we think we can render visible and it's important for marginalized culture and marginalized people who are struggling to rep to represent themselves and to bring to visibility what has been rendered invisible before. But we cannot just stop there. You know, it would be totally binary, abiding by binary thinking to think of the visible and the invisible as an opposite pair. We have to go into um, the, the uh, when we deal with the invisible, we also have to deal with what is invisible within the visible and what is visible yeah. In the realm of what we call invisible, see, so this is how one create what I call a new scene, and how one sees with eyes wide shut. Yeah, this is extremely meaningful, especially um, today in our big cities where everything is uh, made of light, and in any public or private space, you have uh, these lights uh, constantly uh, being upon our heads, or uh, the, the use of the phone is also, also another screen, you know, so that, that we have to deal with. And I think traveling uh, in the dark is also related to this uh, um, process of uh, Revisiting the archives, especially when I I am watching uh, your your movies, you are dealing with different layers. You are a presence nearby uh, a locality or uh, different peoples, and <clears throat> you are also questioning our um, how to say our relation, individual or collective relation to history or to histories, or how do we deal uh, uh, by histories uh, that are forgotten or excluded? So I, I wanted to uh, raise this uh, question of um, the materiality of your films are made of uh, layers of uh, memories, uh, uh, voices of individuals, and also your own uh, comments or aphorism or poetry are making much more uh, dense, rich and complex uh, this relation to history, isn't it? Yes, you know, actually in, in um, What About China, it is very clear because I am using um, footage that I shot in 93, 94, but uh, that is not merely the past, as people would think. Just because it is situated in 93, 94 doesn't mean that it is the past, because there is a statement in the film that says, what if, you know, the ancient is not past, and the modern neither present nor futuristic, you know, because we tend to think of the ancient and the modern as opposite. But actually, what is uh, we know very well that in uh, society, we cannot simply throw away what is old, especially, you know, for example, when it comes to the older generation, our parents, our relatives, who are our elderly, for example, you cannot just simply throw away the, the old. We talk about it, you know, in a way that is that separate the material from the human or the spiritual, but actually all aspects, you know, are together. And so when we talk about time, and this is not peculiar to myself, uh, there are many cultures, you know, uh, oceanic culture, for example, that really um, deal with time in terms of the spiral. You can see how people actually draw the spiral on their face, on their skin, and so on, because the spiral is a form of growth that the, the spiraling in and spiraling out is a form of growth and it's never static. You know, so history does not go in linear 
line, you know, linear time. But actually, history is like a spiral. We go, come back to uh, what we call the old, but actually we never come back to the same place because of what we are at. You know, so the returning is never returning to, to the same place. And this, you know, allows us to always move. And it's in the spiral. You are never static. You are never reduced. You are constantly moving uh, what, what in linear time we can call past and present, but actually in the, in the spiral, it doesn't make sense anymore. Yes. So this is, how, this is how I see history, you know, that uh, China's history is really rich. And when we look at um, the notion of painting, for example, you know, what has been brought out in the modern time in Western culture with uh, Bertolt Brecht, with uh, the paintings of um, Picasso and the whole Cubist movement, for example, it is something that in ancient Chinese art, you already have this, uh, you know, in the Song Dynasty, for example, you already have this theory of the three ways, the mobile view, you know, so that you not only look up, you know, from below, you look um, down from up and you look ahead of yourself flat and, um, uh, how do I, how do, does it go? Um, you look right in front and expand. So these three kinds, this mobile view, you see it in the painting itself. Of course, the West looking at this painting uh, at the beginning, you know, they didn't understand. Uh, and they were saying things like, these painters do not have a sense of uh, perspective, you know, but Perspective is a notion that is very, in a way, you know, very static because everything comes from one view and it goes, uh, you know, in front of you. So perspective is so reductive compared to the mobile view of ancient uh, Chinese arts. And you see that that mobile view is now brought again forward through digital technology. So here we have the meeting of the ancient and the most avant-garde, <laughs> which is the position that I I see myself in. And I also see the music that I have chosen for the film in that position as well. Yeah, and when you talk about this uh, oceanic aspect of different uh, areas, it's, it's really related also to what the museum we are trying to develop is uh, is to consider art and, and and the way we engage with the space or with the culture not only as a possession or a territory but always as an extension that is an ongoing change and this i think is also very meaningful not only because of the fluidity but also because it has uh, different forms of stability or instability, uh, different ways of experiencing, you know, the, the other and, and the self and, and how do we um, negotiate or how do we represent uh, ourselves in, in, in different possibilities. So uh, that's also why I'm so, happy and honored to have you at uh, the Rockpoon Art Museum. And talking about the oh, exhibition and, the, and also the collaboration with the three institutions, the Rockpoon Art Museum, the NTUCCA in Singapore, and the Kunstverein in Stuttgart, for example, you just opened an exhibition that is called um, uh, The Ocean in a Drop, right? And it is just beautiful and echoing this uh, traveling in the dark and the project in, in, in Singapore was also uh, quite uh, powerful. So uh, in terms of exhibition making, do you have any interest in putting into perspective different aspects of your creation? Yes. Um... You know, actually, the, the three uh, 
the three exhibition that you have just mentioned in Singapore, in Stuttgart, and in Shanghai. The three exhibitions are actually um, uh, in totally different from one another because, of course, the space is different. Hence, you know, since the exhibition is always site specific, um, it is different. But in terms of what it shares, I think one of the wonderful thing about exhibition, instead of showing my film, for example, in a theater, uh, a movie theater, um, where you sit through the whole length of the film in one go, in exhibition space, you have a shorter span of attention, which at the beginning, you know, I didn't know how to deal with that, you know, since. I was wondering what would be happening to my film when people just come in for 10, 15 minutes or half an hour or things like that. But what uh, the what comes out, you know, what proves to be different and in a way, uh, so it creates a different form of viewing is the fact that it is spatial. You know, the spatial quality of an exhibition allows people to go from one room to another making links there where they didn't see before, you know, between the different films, but also the space, you know, that is created within the exhibition, just like uh, the one that is created for the exhibition in Shanghai, you know, the um, going into the dark where we have different floor for different films. So we have a space for reading and we have a space where you know, quotes and uh, images that are from the film and from the books are inviting um, viewers, you know, to meander through that space. So a space that reproduces the different layers, you know, that you find in the film, but now in a spatial way, and then the reading space that offer something in addition to the film, but is totally related also to the film in its making process, in its writing process. And then you have the screening space itself, which is you know, also something that we have worked on, you know, quite at some length, because we had to isolate the sound, you know, for example, in a way that the movie theater didn't have to. So uh, I think there are many aspects, you know, these many aspects are what is shared among these three exhibitions. And I'm quite happy about it because it's the first time that the body of my work come together spatially. It's not like other you know, exhibition space where I was just given a room where one of my film is being shown. Here, you know, you have all these space that come together and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you very much. I'm so grateful <laughs> for your uh, contribution. And uh, uh, I think we need to stop here our conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Trinity Minha. And also, just to finish, would like to emphasize the, the, the Ropun Art Museum uh, with the Professor Uteme Tabawa, director of the NTUCC, have partnered to support the production of the movie What About China? And this, since the spring 2022, uh, this movie has been shown in numerous film festivals and important art institutions and events, including, for example, the CPH Docs Film Festival in Copenhagen, uh, the Biennale of the Whitney Museum of Art in New York, San Francisco International Film Festival, House de Culture and the Welt in Berlin, Jean Roche International Film Festival in Paris and many others. And this movie, I'm so happy, has been acclaimed and received uh, different prizes. So congratulations and really thank you so much uh, for the project you are offering to us. And I sincerely and warmly invite um, the audience uh, from Shanghai, but from anywhere uh, to experience uh, your creation. Thank you very much, Minha. Thank you, Laris. Yeah.